and welcome to Ottawa Experts. I'm your host, Barbara Balfour. It's been more than 100 years since Canadian women were given the right to vote, and yet we still remain underrepresented at every legislature across the country. Even though women comprise over half the population in Canada, they occupy only 27% of the seats in House of Commons. This low percentage is at a historical high, but it actually ranks Canada 59th in the world behind Mexico, Rwanda, and Vietnam. There is a profound and urgent need for more women to join the political sphere to make sure that their viewpoints are reflected in public policies and in decision making. We only need to look to our neighbors to the south for an example of why this is so important. If you or someone close to you is a woman thinking about getting into politics, you are in the right place. And if you're unsure of how to start or how you might handle life as a woman on Parliament Hill, this is the show for you. We have a very special panel of guests joining us tonight who will be speaking to their experiences as women on the political stage and sharing advice if you've ever thought about throwing your hat in the ring. First, I am so honored to introduce one of Canada's foremost female politicians, the Honorable Sheila Copps. She is the first woman to ever hold the position of Deputy Prime Minister in Canada and has been a prominent figure in Canadian public life for more than 35 years. She's known for being feisty and tough, and she's turned that into a trademark of her political career. My favorite Sheila Copps story is when the then Minister of Justice, John Crosby, told her in a heated debate to just quiet down, baby, and Sheila replied, I'm nobody's baby, and then she turned it into the title of her first book. <laughs> Sheila has been an advocate for the rights of women and minorities, the environment, marijuana legislation, and numerous other causes. Welcome to the show, Sheila. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you, Barbara. Next, I'd like to welcome Alexandra Mendez, Member of Parliament for the writing of Brossard Saint Lambert. She immigrated from Portugal to Canada in 1978 and has been actively involved in political life since 2001. She was first approached by the Liberal Party to run in 2006. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Later on in the show, we'll be joined via telephone by Nasha Brownridge. She is a spokesperson for Equal Voice. That's an organization that's dedicated to electing more women to all levels of political office in Canada. And she'll be sharing some great resources and programs that you can tap into, so make sure you stick around for that. And as always, we welcome you to ask questions of our guests and join the conversation. Please call us at 613-728-1001, 613-728-1001. One, we're excited to hear from you. Sheila, let's start with you. You're a second generation member of a political family from Hamilton. Both your parents were actively involved. Did you always know that you were going to get into politics? Well, actually, my mother didn't get involved until after I got involved. My dad was the mayor, and I grew up in a family where we were encouraged to debate. Um, but I really didn't have a good idea of the broader spectrum because I, I got on first time I ever got on a plane I was 20 years old and my world was kind of Hamilton that area um, so I think my parents taught me to um, defend my ideas and to um, pursue truth and also to listen and investigate because a lot of times issues issues in those days the biggest issue when my dad was first uh, running for mayor was whether or not you should be allowed to have sports on Sunday <laughs> it used to be against the law in Ontario to have sports on Sunday mm. and that was a vote so there were many debates around uh, should we allow sports mm. to be operating on Sunday it's incredible when you think about it now it seems so arcane but and was mm. there something about that time or those stories that made you think I really want a piece of the action well, I used to go around with my dad campaigning. We used to go do bingo halls. That was a great spot. And in those days, they didn't give away thousands of dollars of prizes. They'd give away like a $10 line. So he would bring in a stuffed animal. And they'd stop for a second and they'd say, the cops is here, you have five minutes. So he'd be calling one line to give away one stuffed animal. And we'd be running around all the, <laughs> all the tables making sure that we got everything down. And I always loved it. I have three siblings and my one sister absolutely hated it. My mm. other sister and my brother kind of liked it, but I just loved it from the beginning. I loved the people aspect of it. And I never, I never thought, oh, I'm going to go into politics when I'm young. I actually thought when I was middle-aged I would. But then I ended up getting in quite early, which was a bit of an oddity at the time. Mm -hmm. What about you, Alexandra? You were still a young child when the revolution happened in Portugal. 
I was not yet 11, yes, and uh, in, in April 74, 45 years this year, and um, I, I just, I don't know why, but it sparked a passion in me that hasn't left me since. I, I've adored, and I don't come from a political family at all. I come from a very... Um, uh, a debating family, yes, absolutely. We love debating ideas. My parents were always very keen on current affairs, but not political in the sense of being active politically. But uh, because it was the first time in Portugal in two generations where people could actually vote and could express ideas freely, um, it became very um, effervescent, and you know, everybody was getting into it. I became a member of a political party for the first time. I was 13 years old. And funnily enough, the person who got me involved in politics, well, who got me as a member in a party, is now the mayor of the city where I used to live. Ah. So, you know, the world tends to be quite interesting in its, in its coincidences. But, um, but yes, the, 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 the fact that the revolution in Portugal was was very mild in terms of, of impact. There was no, no nobody killed. There was no 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 blood in mm -hmm. the streets. It's called the, the carnation revolution for a reason because the soldiers were given carnations by the women on the streets because nobody was shooting anybody. It's a very civilized revolution. Very civilized, <laughs> but but also the fact that when I came to Canada, and my friends in Portugal kept telling us, "Oh, you're going to be so bored," because they knew how I loved it. Uh, Canadian politics must be so boring, blah, blah, blah. We never hear about Canada. And I arrived in Quebec in 78, August 78, and we are starting the debate on the referendum. So the first referendum in Quebec. So absolutely no boringness in, at all in, in, in Canadian politics. And well, I mean, some people actually say, well, Canadian politics is quite boring compared to our southern counterparts. But you have some strong opinions about that, that politics affects every facet of our lives. Absolutely. Politics is life. You know, you, there's, that, there's nothing in life that isn't touched by politics in one way or, or another, from the health care you receive from the schools you, you attend, from the price of groceries, the roads you, you drive on, everything is about politics. So yes, I am very opinionated about that, <laughs> absolutely, as in many other things. Now both of you are mothers, two daughters. Sheila, you were the first member of parliament uh, to be sitting and you gave birth to your child. And she's 32 now, wow. which is going to shock a lot of people because it sort of seems like it was only yesterday, mm -hmm. but she's 32. What was it like <laughs> raising a daughter while, you know, at the pivotal moment in your career? You know what, I think parents, when they have children, um, it isn't until they become grandparents that they realize how much work it was being a parent, because <laughs> I lugged her all across the country. And even when I was breastfeeding in the beginning, it was fairly easy because she didn't have to worry about like warming up bottles because she just <laughs> st was stuck her on. <laughs> and so I didn't find it so difficult. But when I look back on it, I kind of think, oh my God, how did how did I how get did there? She, no, how did she survive too? Because <laughs> it's uh, it's a big country. But she did make a lot of friends, and until they actually start school, the one thing that's good about Parliament Hill, I think, actually better than. City Hall and some and provincial is that they actually have a, a child care mm -hmm. set up by Jeanne Sauvé who was the first woman speaker. Mm -hmm. So from the time they're toilet trained until they enter school, they're fairly close and you can really keep an eye on them while you're still working, which mm -hmm. is good. Mm -hmm. I want to hear your thoughts on this, Alexander, but first we have a caller. Andrea, are you with us? Hi, yes I am. Thank you so much for joining us. What was your question? So my question is, is do you think, like, say me, for instance, I'm a single parent, would me getting into politics be realistic as a single parent? I was a single parent when my daughter, when, when I had my daughter, I was married and I got divorced when she was a very small child. So it is possible. It's doable. I think the biggest um, roadblocks, luckily in Canada, you don't need a huge amount of money either. I think the most important thing for people thinking about getting into politics is what stokes your passion? Mm. Is there a community issue that you can get involved with? Because you really need to have a good, strong and robust network and not just your family, but mm. also your friends, your neighbors, your community. And some people think, oh, I want to be a politician. Well, I think it's m more likely to think I want to fight for this issue and then the politics comes with it as opposed to defining a career choice as a politician and then just getting mm -hmm. behind whatever party is Agreed. going to get you elected. What are your thoughts on this, Sandra? Well, I agree abs absolutely because actually my my involvement in, in terms of activism was 
with a non-profit organization, a non-governmental non organization that worked with immigration and uh, immigrants and refugees. And I worked there for 15 years before I ever went into politics, but it was a very active lifestyle and I, I had to do a lot of politics. Mm -hmm. I had to do and be very involved in defending and advocating the, the, the people I was supposed to be helping. So those those were definitely the passions that stoked me was was what got me very very uh, involved in my community and to this day I go around my my, my community Brossard and people still remember me from Maison Internationale mm -hmm. because that's where they saw me become very active I, I go to door darking and people say oh I still remember I left Maison Internationale 17 years ago mm -hmm. and they still remember this because that's what made me really into the community person mm -hmm. that they recognize mm -hmm. but that is important I, I totally agree with Sheila you have to have something that really animates you and, mm -hmm. and, and feeds you into thank you for that. calling in Andrea but uh, just piggybacking on this single parent idea having only one single source of income no matter how passionate you are mm. you still have to put food on the table um, you know what do you do if you don't have that safety well, net what's quite interesting if you look at the whole spectrum of how to get more women involved in politics actually at the federal level we're doing three times better than they are at City Hall mm. City Hall is the least friendly place for women across the country and nobody's really focused mm. in on it because they don't attach to political parties except local but they, I think I, I think, think if I may actually I think because they think it's close by that they don't need to worry about it mm. no but, I'm, what but I'm talking about being in in City Hall yeah, if yeah. you're thinking about for example the difficulties of being a federal or provincial MP by rights it should be easiest to run and to get active mm -hmm. at City Hall and why are we not what's mm. the lacune as they say in French the Federal Federation of Canadian Municipalities has a small committee mostly women uh, political people across the country looking at that mm. but it does tie into um, I think the sense amongst a lot of people and you re referenced this before we came on air about thinking that oh well politics is not for me because there's something dirty about it or something mm. that people mm. don't get involved it would be really great to see city halls across the country becoming at least as representative as the federal parliament Mm -hmm. which is still not mm -hmm. fully representative. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We're just about to go to break. I want to hear more on that and your thoughts about partnership and raising your daughters as well and how life today compares to when you first started your career, Sheila. So don't go away. We'll be right back after the break with lots more. This program is brought to you by MLB Extra Innings, part of the Rogers Super Sports Pack. Follow the teams and players you want to watch. I'm Paula Roy from Paula Roy's Favorite Foods. Catch my show each week when I'm going to share with you some of my favorite recipes to make your home cooking more fun and more successful. Why don't you join me as I eat A soup smorgasbord and stuffed chicken wings We'll do hot lobster rolls to a dizzy Taste what happens when a dumpling and a burger get busy We'll add a little pizza to the roster Head to the birthplace of Bananas Foster Melt away your blues with some collard greens Or oh, dare we put spaghetti inside grilled cheese And that's just the gist of my big food bucket list New series Friday, May 24th on Food Network Who ordered these? Hi, I'm Jennifer Anderson. And I'm Allison Schaefer. And we are the hosts of The Parenting Show. How great that Rogers has a TV show where we can address all the common parenting issues. It's all the issues that you face and to let you know that you are not alone. And I can offer you some great expert advice. Things like picky eating, how to get your kids to sleep, dealing with those blowouts at homework time. All those things and more right here on Rogers TV.
Welcome back to Auto Experts. I'm your host, Barbara Balfour. On tonight's show, we're discussing barriers to women in politics with special guests Sheila Copps and Alexandra Mendez. Now, before we went to break, we talked about the fact that you both have daughters and you know, some of the difficulties in raising children uh, while being at these pivotal moments in your career and trying to move forward. Now, both of your daughters are fully grown. If they came to you now and said, I want to enter a career in politics, what advice would you give them based on what you've been through yourself? If I may, and this is a piece of, a piece of uh, wisdom that I, I've uh, read, uh, or, or sh I mean, I, I share from uh, the current Senator Mivul Shen. She was at the time the president of the uh, Status of Women Council in Quebec, mm -hmm. and she was just doing her exit interview. And at one point, uh, the journalist asked her, okay, what, what do you think women can't have everything? She said, no, no, women can have everything, but they can't have it all at the same time. And I would say to my daughter, who's 33 years old, who has two very young boys, my precious grandsons, uh, I would say, wait, don't do it now. Their childhood goes by so quickly, mm -hmm. like hers did. And I, remember, I still remember feeling that she was growing so fast that I wasn't keeping up with it. I mean, you had a different experience, Sheila, but, but that was the way it happened for you. But I mean, I would not recommend that you do it now mm -hmm. if, and if I she would can. I would because I think what children learn from first of all if you're running for member of parliament you're almost like kind of managing your own schedule and your own agenda and you have a small staff but you're almost like a self-employed person but mm -hmm. with a lot more support mm -hmm. when my daughter was very young she had a chance to see the country in a way that her cousins who were both raised in a very um, uh, father and mother, doctor, Tradition. social Nuclear worker, yeah. um, their life experience was not as adaptable. Mm. And now she's super adaptable. So there's certain things that can come out of it that are also good. It's not all bad. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I think the biggest challenge, and we, we sort of broached this a little bit in advance, is probably to the marriage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because yes, I think for people who are gone away a lot, it's like being a a traveling salesman or a truck driver, your right. absence from home does not always make the heart grow fonder. Mm. And I think that's more challenging than actually children. And then I want to talk and about... I, and I would say that for both Sheila and, and myself, we're very lucky. We are close to our constituencies, mm. reasonably close. I'm, mm. I'm two hours away, Sheila, we're what, four hours? Well, six, but an hour and a half by plane or By whatever. plane. Yeah. 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 But I mean, reasonably yeah. close. Yeah. Our colleagues who are out west or up north, they have much bigger challenges, and and I would most definitely not recommend mm. parents with young children if they can't bring the children to live with them in Ottawa. It would be extremely difficult. And is that because it's it's also not fair for the spouse? Not fair for the spouse, but not fair for the kids. Mm -hmm. I mean, they would spend the whole week without the parent, but sometimes two or three weeks until the parents could go back home. I have colleagues who take eighteen hours to get back home. Mm. From Ottawa, but I think you also because see. I mean, in, in, like, let's, and let's supposing you're in the military, mm. and you go away for six yeah. months. I mean, I think that there are professions. Yes, but there are. Different? There are also. I think there are ways that you can manage your life because you do have a lot of support. I think conversely about somebody who's working in a downtown hotel and making minimum wage and their kid is sick and they're a single parent and then what do they do mm. because they can't call up somebody in the office and mm -hmm. say hey I'm not coming in today and you know can you do this for me or do that for me yes there are challenges but the positives in my opinion outweigh the bent, the negatives and probably what you need to do is invite the kids and ask them yeah. <laughs> to come on to, the show. And, and, yeah, exactly. Ask totally our daughters. Yeah. 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 They might have a totally yeah. different perspective. Yeah. Yeah. But, but I, I did have a very, very um, demanding life when my daughter yeah. was a child. But I took her everywhere with me. But, but a bit but, like but you, you did. Also yeah. feel, but you also kind of feel, I see my, my, uh, my stepchildren now raising kids and our, my grandchildren are now in their teens. When they were younger, you just wonder how the parents juggle all these mm. things. And when you're juggling it, you don't even realize. It's like, I consider it to be like the little hamster on the wheel. <laughs> and you don't realize how, how much you're running, 13 kilometers a night, until you stop. Yeah. <laughs> but isn't there a double, a double standard when the woman is the one that has to of be course. away for oh, work? Oh, absolutely. I heard a stat this week. I don't know if it's true, but I, 
didn't surprise me. The average woman works 96 hours who's working outside yeah. the home if you incorporate yeah. their home and their out of home activities. Mm -hmm. that, that doesn't surprise me. Yeah. We have a caller on the line, Eve, are you with us? I am. Thank you so much for joining us. Did you have a question? I do. I was wondering how you change yourself, your personality, your outlook on life to be able to compete in a man's world. <laughs> Good question. Well, hopefully you don't. Yeah. I mean, I think part of the, I mean, when I started off in Ontario, I was the only woman in my caucus and we were only six women out of 125 in the legislature. So the nice thing about having, even though it's only 26% women in the house now, you have so many colleagues. Mm. We have 50% ministers etc cetera, etc cetera. senators the biggest challenge when, when when you're very small in number is that you're supposed people think you're supposed to act like men like I was always attacked for having this very high voice well my voice is actually not really high but because it was a woman's voice with mm. a lot of men it kind of came through like that <laughs> <laughs> so I think the idea is to try and hang on to the things that you hold dear and not change but also and this is something that I think women need to take to heart. I think as young girls, we're oftentimes um, protected from failure mm -hmm. uh, in sports, in different things. And I think we need to learn how to fail and to embrace failure because you do fail and you pick up and you carry on. And boys in sport pick up and carry on. And I think we Lord need to learn that. Yeah, we need to they, learn that more. Yeah. Mm -hmm. As politicians, when has being a woman served in your favor? When has it been a blessing to be a woman? I've always thought it, it is a blessing. I've never, I, I honestly cannot say that I've seen it as a barrier. The fact that I'm a woman or I'm an immigrant, I've never seen it as a barrier. I, I often say probably I'm too arrogant to, to actually notice it, but I've believed, and I've been, I was fortunate to be raised with parents, by parents, who never ever told me you can't do this because mm -hmm. you're a woman or you're this or you're that. So it's been helpful to have that kind of confidence and, and you know, yes, you, you dream. The only thing I've ever, I've ever been told I couldn't be the moment I was diagnosed with uh, nearsightedness was a pilot. My father was a pilot for Portuguese Airlines and he told me, well, finished, you can't be a pilot. And that was the only thing I was ever told I couldn't be, not ne nothing else. So I've always believed that if I dreamt about something and if I worked hard for it, I should be able to reach I it. Think I think my experience has been different um, mm. and not in a negative way, but certainly I, I can recount numerous times sitting around the cabinet table, even when I was deputy prime minister, and the clerk of the Privy Council, who's the highest ranking bureaucrat, would be going around the room on a room call and he'd go, Mr. Gray, Mr. Axworthy, Mr. Colinette, Sheila. Mm -hmm. Like literally yes. you'd even have your first name attached to you because you're more familiar, yeah. but in another way it's also demeaning. Um, it is demeaning. It's not Insulted? intended to be well it's not intended to be demeaning. I know he didn't mean it that way, but I'm just saying that my experience over time um, has been and I mean if you look most recently at Mr. Trudeau's decision to put fifty percent women in cabinet, the biggest uh, screaming came from the media, mm -hmm. who are mostly white men. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's uh, changing as if too. Doubting that the competence yes. was yeah. in depth. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Is it that difficult to realize that 50% of the women are as competent as mm -hmm. the other 50% of the men? We have a caller on the line. Rob, are you with us? Yes, I am. Thank you so much for calling in. What was your question? Yes, as a father growing and bringing up girls, uh, if they're interested in the future going to politics, would it be advisable for me to recommend to them to still become like a lawyer because I know most politicians come from the <laughs> lawyer world. I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> Neither am I. <laughs> I think what you, what I tried to encourage my daughter is to follow your passion mm. and that different roads can lead to politics. I actually studied, um, I have a degree in English and French and I wanted to study journalism and my first full-time job was actually with the Ottawa Citizen mm. as a reporter. <laughs> but I came at it from the root of communications, but I never intended to become a politician. Mm -hmm. it, it, so I think you, you have to encourage your daughters to f find the things that drive their passion. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, now we've got a scientist, uh, uh, an astronaut. A, we have an yeah. astronaut who is a minister, and yeah. you know, we have a scientist who's well, a minister. We're a minister. We have, so we have doctors. Yeah. We have you know, many, we many have, different yeah. people. Thank you for calling in, Rob. Tell me about the mentors that you've had. Were they male? Were they female? Were they a combination of both? And and how would you advise someone to approach a potential political mentor? Well, when I was 
sort of starting, I don't think we even had the concept of mentors. Was it more informal? This is the interesting thing, and, when, and it does tie in together with uh, the role of men and how people mm. get promoted and everything, because you usually have the service clubs, mm. like the Kinsmen and the Lions yeah. and the different clubs that would the sort of go out and try yeah. and find um, their next leaders. And the women weren't necessarily in that sort of catchment group. So from my perspective, I, I'd say my, my own... I, I never went out, I, we get calls now, would you like to mentor somebody? And we never had a, a formalized system. It was more trying to connect with people that you admired. And in my day, it would probably have been like Monique Bejan, who right. was pushing through the Canada Health Act at the time, and Judy Erola when we had the charter fight, and some of these really great women who were on the, on the cutting edge. Monique just came out with a book. Yes, yeah. she yeah. did. Yeah. I had a very, I was very, very fortunate because of the simple fact that I smoke. <laughs> 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 when I was elected the first time, um, I, I was looking for, for a place to stay here in Ottawa, mm -hmm. and somebody told me, why don't you speak with Marlene Jennings? She's, uh, she's a smoker too, and maybe she, she has an apartment, maybe. <laughs> so I went to Marlene Jennings and we I mean we, we had seen each other at conventions things like that but I, I had no relationship close relationship with her and I approached her and said you know Marlene would it said listen I've never had a roommate in my life I'm not used to having roommates but we'll give it a month's try and we'll see okay and we spent two and a half years together mm. and we are you know we mm -hmm. call ourselves sister friends <laughs> um, we got along beautifully and Marlene was phenomenally important in helping me be so successful and, and I, I, I do think that my first mandate, I, I had a first mandate from 2008 to 2011, was very successful because I had her mentorship. She was very good at teaching me all the house procedure, all the, the, yeah. the, the, the legislative uh, tricks that I had no idea. Do you think you would have no learned idea. by yourself if she wasn't around? Eventually, of course, but painful. I mean it would have been blank tier, of course, and we were opposition then. I mean, we were not government in a, in a minority situation, so everything was very precarious. We had the prorogation come in at the mid. What the, what on earth was prorogation? I had never heard about it. So all of this was extremely useful for me to have someone with Marlene's wisdom and knowledge right beside me, teaching me along. And uh, I, I benefited immensely from her friendship and from her mentorship. But I didn't go out seeking her. It was pure accident of, of well, just being smokers, <laughs> yeah. but but it, it helped me immensely. And nowadays, I'm trying to do that to the other ones who have come. Yeah. We're yeah, just about to go to break. When we come back, we will hear from Nasha Brownridge from Equal Voice. She'll be talking about some of the programs and resources you can tap into if you're considering a life in politics on the Hill. We'll be right back after the break. Play four games of bingo from the comfort of your own home each Monday at 7 p.m. for your chance to win money from our $2,000 regular bingo or $5,000 super bingo night. Kiwanis TV Bingo, Mondays at 7 p.m. on Rogers TV. Was that four or five? He's lost count and still thinks he can drive. Do you think he knows that when he is caught and charged with impaired driving, he'll lose his license and a lot more? If he gets in his car, he'll face costs exceeding $20,000. Does he realize he could have a criminal record for his choice to drive? And it could be much worse if he crashes. I wonder what he'll be thinking tomorrow. I'm for have a hold one at one five. Visit arrivealive.org to find out more. Arrive alive. Drive so. I have no idea who I'm supposed to be out there. I myself have come from a wrestling family too. I know exactly what it means to you. But don't worry about being the next me. Be the first you. Kyle's dead. Tell me what happened. We got mixed up with some drug dealer. I'm gonna kill him. Three of Viking's drug dealers have disappeared. What makes you think you can kill a man? I read it in a crime novel. Working here as a volunteer is a good way to get to know your community. It's a good way to learn how to work as a part of a team, and it's a good way to meet some really wonderful people. I learned a lot from the other volunteers and from the staff coming through here about uh, production techniques. I'm Ken Grant, and I'm a Rogers TV volunteer. 
Each week on Real Talk with Sarah, I'm joined by experts in the field of wellness who share their expertise and guide us to optimal health of mind, body, and soul. Join me Sundays at 8 p.m. for Real Talk with Sarah on Rogers TV. Welcome back to Auto Experts. I'm your host, Barbara Balfour, and we're in the studio talking about barriers to women in politics with special guests Sheila Copps and Alexandra Mendes, and we are now joined by our third guest, Nasha Brownridge from Equal Voice. Welcome to the show, Nasha. Thank you so much, Barbara. Thank you so much for joining us. Tell us a little bit about your, your organization. Absolutely, yeah. So Equal Voice, as I believe both people on the air know, <laughs> so we are a national, multi-partisan, and bilingual not-for-profit organization. Mm -hmm. Uh, we're dedicated to electing more women at all levels of government. Um, what makes us unique is that we are multi-partisan and not non-partisan, <laughs> uh, which means we actually actively work with all political parties to equip and engage women in electoral politics. Uh, we work in many different files, but part of our work is actually identifying systematic barriers that contribute to women being underrepresented at all levels of government. Um, and many of those barriers have already been spoken to by no one better than those who have actually experienced them. Mm -hmm. um, recently, actually in November of 2018, so just last year, uh, we commissioned a study uh, that was conducted by Abacus Data on the perception of women in politics. And what I find incredibly interesting, having listened to the first half of the show tonight, is the top three reasons women don't tend to engage in politics or run for office have already been discussed. So issues like time with family, mm -hmm. uh, politics are not friendly, and the fact that men and women are treated very differently. Um, and another thing that was brought up, one of the top recommendations from the women who participated in that study, um, I believe it was Sheila that brought this up, is that they want mentors. Yes. Uh, they want people to help them through this process. and equal voice provide some of the resources mm. that can help them uh, so if anyone has the opportunity definitely visit our website it's equalvoice.ca uh, but we have uh, for instance our getting to the gate which was funded under our votes to victory program and it's a tool kit so to speak uh, that allows women who want to run to find the tools they need to do so uh, we're also in the final stages of development with a technology component, um, which is EV, our chatbot, which will help link different uh, women who are looking to either run or engage in different campaigns uh, to ask simple questions and get their answers immediately. Um, now, and if, then, yeah, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Now, if a, if a woman was watching the show right now and thought, you know, I'd really like to throw my hat in the ring, I'd like to pursue a political career, can you take us some of the preliminary steps she should take, some of the people and organizations that she should reach out to, and maybe some of the funding opportunities that are available to her? Absolutely, yes. Yeah. So one thing that's really important to note is many women have actually already taken the first big step in engaging in the partisan politics realm, which is getting involved in their communities. We know that women are doing that. Um, so we heard earlier mentioned being involved in not-for-profit organizations, uh, whether it's volunteering for those who do have children. We know that women are still the primary caretakers here in Canada. Um, getting involved in the schools and the different components. Mm. That's how you're making the connections and meeting people. Those are the funders and the volunteers and the donors and honestly, the voters, um, particularly if you're looking to run in the area that you're actually currently living. Mm. Um, everyone's path or journey is gonna be very different. Mm. Even tonight, we've heard from two women in politics that have very different backgrounds. So it is hard to generalize on what the next step is based on where someone is, where someone is currently positioned in their community. One thing always recommended, and it was mentioned again, that uh, you know municipal is very different from provincial and federal mm -hmm. levels. Mm -hmm. But in the provincial and federal levels, um, there are the political parties. And it is worth reaching out to those resources. Those parties are looking for candidates. They're looking to provide the resources. And they do have a lot of them. Mm -hmm. Now, if, if let's say you're a single parent um, and you, you're going to need to take a year off to do door knocking, and that means quitting your job, 
Um, I don't think you need to quit your job to be yeah. a candidate. No. And first no. of all, I would not suggest Dorn <coughs> as the first mode of attack because, mm. um, anyway, that's that's for another for another day. But mm. I think you can still carry on with what you're doing in the community and when it gets closer to the red. But I think the first thing that you may want to do, and Nasha sort of cut me off if you think I'm off base here, but I wrote a book in 1986, and you referenced it. Mm -hmm. It's out of print, but it's worth borrowing from the public library because what the, the actual title was called Nobody's Baby, A Woman's Guide to Survival in Politics. But I wrote the thing as a primer of what it is hmm. to be in a nomination because for somebody to make the decision to say, I want to be in politics, I think you need to first amass a whole bunch of information mm. to see if you're actually really going to like it. Mm. You may hate it. Mm -hmm. And there are people who actually get involved and get elected and then discover mm -hmm. in the first term that they hate it. Mm -hmm. yeah. So there's that aspect of it. And where Equal Voice is really well positioned is they've got all these toolkits and places where you can connect with people and do some basic learning about what it is first and then throw your hat in the ring. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the other possibility, I think, for many, many women and men is to get involved in their local political associations. Mm -hmm. That's how I started. Yeah. with my own political association in the constituency. That's what got me interested and, and really you know, involved. And you can also meet people so and you meet, also yeah. know if their views are aligned with your with views. Yours, exactly. Because you may yeah. think, oh, my father was a liberal, so I'm going to be a liberal. Mm. Well, maybe it turns out that it's mm. absolutely not, not what you want. Not yeah. your, yeah. yeah not so your, that helps you learn. But what about fundraising? System. Well, the thing with fundraising is, thankfully, we're not in the United States. Uh, the legislation that is currently structured allows you to spend the equivalent of a postage stamp. Mm. So overall, be, depending upon the writing, it's changed a little bit, but maybe seventy, eighty thousand dollars $80,000 is your cost. If you spread that over four years, any person who's got any community support should be able to raise $20,000 a year. Yeah. It's mm -hmm. not like, you, it's I mean, not you, could have, you could have bake sales and garage sales, and we did. Mm -hmm. So it's and not spaghetti dinners yeah, exactly. and spaghetti you know, dinners barbecues and those. Mm -hmm. but, but the also, and that's one of my, how shall I put it, my, my, my ambitions is to bring back the uh, public subsidies on, yeah. uh, for votes. Mm -hmm. I, I, I despise the idea that the Conservatives saw that as mm -hmm. a, a, a waste of public money. I'm mm -hmm. sorry, but paying parties for, for getting people elected mm. is the best way to ensure that every vote counts. Mm. Mm -hmm. It's the most democratic way of mm. ensuring that every vote counts. Mm -hmm. You are helping the parties build themselves a war chest, mm -hmm. if you want, and you, and you are giving them an opportunity. And what New Brunswick is doing by, by doubling up the subsidy for those parties that encourage more women, that have more women in, on the ballot. I mean, wonderful. Mm -hmm. That's one way of saying, mm -hmm. okay, mm -hmm. go get more yeah. women. That's to a run. good tool, and I think yeah. actually um, the Equal Voice actually has a list of all those tools on their mm. website as well. Yeah. So if is you're that, in public is that, policy, is that right, Nasha? Do you have a, a list of tools on your website that are easily accessible? Yes, we do. And actually, just because obviously it was brought up, but when it comes to finances, there's no doubt that it's a huge concern. Mm -hmm. uh, we've yeah. heard many women anecdotally identify that as one of their major challenges in entering politics. Um, and that brings me to two things, which are the networks that I mentioned earlier. Obviously, fundraising is a huge component. We're not the United States. We don't have that corporate aspect. Um, oh but building those networks as early as possible and making sure that you have the people to go to to help you is huge. Mm -hmm. um, and on top of that, so Equal Voice, we, one of, we recently actually held our first national campaign school. Um, there, we also hold campaign schools across Canada through our chapters. And part of that was we heard so many people asking, how do I do it? What do I do? Um, mm -hmm. So that's actually a huge part of our mandate mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. trying to equip women with the tools needed to actually do that active fundraising because mm -hmm. we know it's not easy. Mm -hmm. Making those phone calls and making those asks Yes. is incredibly difficult, particularly but, but it, it, help, it helps if you have somebody in your network yes. who is very good at fundraising yes. for all sorts Absolutely. of other things. And, and if you're not comfortable doing it yourself, if you have that somebody in your team, you will get the fundraising. You will do it. Mm -hmm. yeah, I'm not comfortable. We definitely focused a lot in our last campaign school on people were saying, how do you build your team? Mm -hmm. And it's, having it's that important. team, I think, is really critical. And I think 
And in fact, usually in politics, the active MP is not involved in raising the money money, because it creates too many Mm -hmm. uh, possibilities for conflict of Mm -hmm. interest and other Mm -hmm. things. Now, I want to switch gears here. We haven't discussed this yet on the show, but I know it's an important part of Life on the Hill, and that's the issue of harassment and misogyny. And I know that you're doing some important uh, work and studies in this realm with your organization, Nasha. Can you speak to, um, you know, the extent of the problem and if that is also a deterrent for people considering entering public life yeah no doubt so we obviously know that our political institutions were because they were built so long ago built by by men for men and that sounds like a bold statement but we know it's true that is the history Um, so part of the work we're doing we actually have two different aspects of this so one of our programs is actually our systemic change program and we're looking at the systemic barriers within the legislatures themselves so not necessarily for women outside who are looking to run but for the women who are already elected and the component of retention which is also really important Mm. Um, how bad is the problem of harassment on the hill so I think that varies between, because we also look at the provincial legislatures, um, but we've heard, especially with the Me Too movement that came out very recently, um, we know it's pervasive, we know it's there. Um, and ever, again, every woman's experience is different based on their background, where they're working. Um, but having harassment policies in place, they will look different depending on the legislature's needs. But I do think that's critical um, at all levels, because we know It is certain that women are experiencing this, um, and there needs to be a mechanism and a process to deal with that. Now, we just have a minute before we uh, go to break and have to say goodbye. just wanted to give you a chance to uh, refresh our viewers' memory in terms of some of the tools and tips and upcoming events they can access and where they can find it on your website. Yeah, so to speak to that quickly, our website is equalvoice.ca. Uh, There we host an abundance of tools and different resources where women can get the tools and advice they need. Um, We can also be reached at info at equalvoice.ca if anyone has any questions about these tools because there are quite a few of them. Um, And generally, the last thing I would leave on is if you're thinking about it, look into it and if you can, do it. (laughs) Thank you, Nasha. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me, Barbara. Have a great evening. You too. Thank you. We just have 30 seconds before we go on to our next segment, but you you had a comment to make there. It's it's beyond the harassment, and I think what's more pervasive and not spoken about enough, it's a sort of discrimination. I think um, Sheila mentioned it about the cabinet table and and having, Mm -hmm. um, having, you know, a certain different way of being dealt with because you're a woman and, and a man. Absolutely, and, and I want to hear more voice, about that. the voice, the woman's voice around yes. the table. And We're just about to go to break when we come back more on harassment on the hill and what's being done with it. Done about it. It's never been done before. Mr. Blake. You can't see down with that thing. Mr. Blake. Jacques. What? They're coming. Hold them up. Find something. Jacques, I'm telling you for the last How time. Many? Are the Canadians finished? This plan coming back on the hey, ice. Come on, come on. Give us something, will you? Please, How gentlemen. many stitches? Gentlemen, please. Go, go, hey, tell me. Let's not the On November 1st, 1959, Jacques Plant of the Montreal Canadiens broke with tradition. You're a brave man, Mr. Plant, standing up to him like that and changed the face of hockey forever. Doors Open Ottawa is back on June 1st and 2nd. Don't miss your chance to explore more than 130 of Ottawa's most interesting buildings, venues, and landmarks free of charge. There are old places, new places, and a lot of cool places. Bring your camera and enter our photo contest on Instagram. We also offer a free downtown shuttle. Get your Doors Open Ottawa guide at Bridgehead Coffee Houses as of May 20th. For more information, visit ottawa.ca. I'm author, speaker, Kathy Donovan. 
Join me for television that's good for your body, mind, spirit, and business. It's Refresh Your Passion, here on Rogers TV. Watching Auto Experts. I'm your host, Barbara Balfour. Before we went to break, we just slightly touched the topic of sexual harassment on the Hill, but I think the issue is more pervasive, and certainly we see that with social media, some of the misogyny and the online trolling that goes on. And even in some of my brief research, when I look at some of the cartoons, the death threats, the tweets that are implying rape or sexual assault, I think to myself, Holy Mother of God, and you know. Sheila, you've 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 gone mm. through a lot, and you've been quite open in talking about your experience with sexual assault and and rape as well. Well, I think first of all, MP, minister, um, religious leadership. What you're looking at is people who are in positions of power and authority. And I don't think, if anything, I think in politics it's probably less bad than what it mm. is in, in the banking system. I have a friend who was in the banking system and her boss was absolutely appalling. And the legal she system. went to HR. Mm. HR, she ended up changing jobs because he, he I mean, anyway, I don't want to get into the details, mm. but the nice thing about being in politics is that people want to know about it and so you can talk about it and it also mm -hmm. will will encourage change. So I think I spoke at one point about the fact when I was, if you can believe it, I was a provincial member. We were studying family violence. We were in Northern Ontario on a tour studying family violence and one of the colleagues jumped me coming out of the elevator, like pushed me up against the wall and tried to start smothering me in kisses and I kicked him in the, in the groin. groin and then he ran away. <laughs> Such irony. That was the end of it, right? Yeah. So I never reported it to anybody because at the time I thought, oh well, it was an unwanted advance that he One got the, the message and he never, he never went after it again, so that was it. But I think that happens in a lot of fields where people don't have the power to even come out and say it, mm. especially for superiors. At least when you're an MP, if it's another MP, you're kind of equals. Yeah. We have a caller on the line. Are you with us? Yes. Thank you so much for watching. Did you have a question for our guests? Um, I do. Just with... Uh, the advent of social media and the internet, like, how do you protect your own privacy when so much is out there in the public eye nowadays? And there's probably a real safety component attached to that too, mm. right? Well, I'll leave that to you because I've been out of active politics for 15 years and frankly it's scary. I mean, you could be nailed it in a store or anywhere with cameras and people after you. I, I had one very bad experience with uh, Facebook in 2016. Uh, I decided that year with my local uh, Islamic community to organize Canada Day at the uh, community center, the Islamic community center. And for that to be known by, by the constituents, we sent out what we call the 10 percenters, so these little brochures that we sent to everybody to inform them about something. And one of my constituents decided to photograph it and post it on Facebook, decrying it. Mm. What is this? We shouldn't be having Canada Day in a mosque. It, it wasn't a mosque. It was a community center, and mm -hmm. it did say. But So suddenly, I'm being showered inundated with the most incredible insults, the most horrible stuff, not by constituents, not, not people from Brossard and Lambert, no, people from all over Quebec, but not from Brossard and Lambert. And it became so bad that the RCMP became involved. Not only were there death threats against me, they were threats against my family, and that, that's when they actually took it very seriously. And the day of the event, because they at one point they advised me you should cancel, I said, there's no way I'm going to cancel it. This is an important thing for this community and for the community of the constituency, not just the, the Islamic community. This is important. We are, we are trying to send a message here, um, and a, a positive message, not a negative one, so I'm not going to, to cancel it. There were police officers everywhere, but it went beautifully. It was a really good event. But well, so let me give you my experience, but because I, this was years that, earlier, and I actually had a fellow come into my mother's office. She was at City Hall. He threw down a magazine, it's called Soldier of Fortune, and he said he was. this was the Uzi he was going to use to kill me. Oh my God. And 
I was like, and he had been phoning our house and harassing my office and everything, so I called the RCMP. And at the time, this is back in the 90s, they said, oh, well, do you really want me to like pursue it? And I said, I most certainly do, because at the time there was a, a, a former television host in um, Ottawa who'd been shot by somebody who wasn't all there. And so I said, I most certainly do. And it turned out that the fellow had um, been convicted of stabbing a reporter. Ooh. They put him under, he was incarcerated for a bit, and then he was given a stay away order and everything. Then they allowed him to change his name. He changed his name from Bob Roberts to William Shakespeare. Wow. And he was in my house, like wow. tracking me in Ottawa. So this was like a random thing. And at the time, the police, RCMP said, well, you know, we should just let this go. These are crazy people. And I'm kind of like, well, no, because it could be something really horrible. Well, they can do harm. Totally, they're not, totally. Yeah. So that's why I think today it's even scarier because you, are out there in all these media it's easy for people to know where you are yeah. at every, oh, any absolutely. given time yeah. and it's and there was an MPP M NDP somebody threw um, a, a firebomb in their office and mm. the, and somebody was actually um, injured and they never found them so there is a lot of danger there is and I mean that's one of the reasons not during a campaign campaign you have to have a very accessible office and yeah. you have but, but my office is on the first floor with an elevator and there are controls. So, yeah. so these we are things that you think about proactively? Oh, absolutely. And then the house helps us. They, they give us a lot of advice. I think they, they're they, getting better at yeah, it. Is, it, is it more because you're a woman or do male? No, no, no it's okay. for all MPs. For all and actually, they even, uh, they even, on this term, not my first term, but this term, the uh, House of Commons Protective Services yeah. contacted all our local police stations. I think it's changed to tell a lot. them yeah. that yeah. we live at this address, so they should do rounds. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I see them. I see the police in my, yeah. in my around my house. Very so I often. think probably now, especially post 9/11, yeah. post uh, you know the incident on Parliament Hill and et cetera, et cetera, it's probably a lot better. Mm -hmm. In the olden days, yeah. it was kind of like, Ignored well, don't bother them, yeah. and forget about it. I had bricks through my window. Well, what was the psychological um, impact of this kind of stuff? Are you looking well, over you know, your you shoulder? To, I, I always feel, and I'm a great believer in karma, that whatever, <laughs> when my number is up, I'm going to be gone. Yeah, so I'm, I don't worry about stuff I like that. I share that with you. I don't really. And, it, and I actually think about this every single time I drive to Ottawa or home. Yeah. I've driven through the most incredibly difficult road conditions, snowstorms, yeah. ice, whatever, and I always say I have a guardian angel somewhere. Or up had a there. plane struck by lightning or, in Shikutami well, or whatever. And God knows, whatever and God knows I travel. <laughs> I've been mm. traveling yeah. so very much. And you know, knock on wood, there's a guardian angel mm -hmm. somewhere. Yeah, yeah. But when the time comes, it will exactly. come. But there's also the block button on Twitter, which you have recently yes. discovered. <laughs> Last <laughs> week. It was like, yeah. oh my God, this is so good. <laughs> yeah. We have a caller on the line. Hannah, are you with us? Yes, I am. Thank you so much for joining us. What was your question? Well, first of all, well, thank you, beautiful women, for bringing this topic <laughs> up, to, up to discussion because it's so well needed. And thank you for your bravery in, in doing so. I know that as, as a child myself, I had shown quite a lot of interest in politics, but due to the nature of it being man's world, I was uh, basically, you know, turned away from that kind of life. And so I'm finding now the passion coming up again to get into politics. So How my old are you? you? I was I was maybe 12, No, now. 18. Oh, 40, 42 now. That's so you're, perfect. You're That's perfect. perfect. <laughs> My mother got elected when she was 60 years old, and she said, all my life I have done for my husband and children. She said, now today I've actually done something for myself. And yes. I thought, good on you, right? I was elected first time I was like 44. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's fantastic. Well, my question basically is, what qualities uh, would you say are most necessary to start running in, say, a municipal government setting, and which qualities would automatically disqualify you or something in your past maybe disqualify you from running? Love people. If you do not like people, do not get into politics. <laughs> I mean, it, it is essential. No, but I, I'm, not, I'm not saying this is as, a, as a flippant remark because people are going to be your mainstay. They are going to be around you mm -hmm. all the time. If you don't love people, if you don't have patience to listen to them, well, don't get into politics because this job is all about that. Well, I, think think, I, think, I think the other piece is to um, 
have a good core sense of yourself mm -hmm. and what you want to accomplish because you do need a very thick skin and there will be a whole load of people who will be there to tell you that you're going to fail. So you have to continue to teach yourself that you have the you have the guts and the confidence and the energy to do what needs to be done. So self-belief, I guess. What's Love people and have a self-belief. Self yeah. What steps can you take to build that thick skin? Because I know it's easier said than done. <laughs> some, some, some of it is inherent in us. I mean, some of it we acquire, but some of it is we have it or we don't. And I mean, obviously, I, I know that I'm a very, I'm a crybaby in many instances. I will get moved yeah. and I am I, I mean I will get moved and I'll come to tears very easily but but I'm also I, I have that self-confidence I do believe in myself very very much and I'm very thankful for the way I was raised for that not just by my parents but by the circle around me my grandmother who absolutely adored me my grandfather who had me in the height so those things help to build that confidence I'm trying to give that to my grandchildren to make them the center of the world they know they are the best they, and and I think that helps so having that self-confidence and and if you now feel that passion coming back up well grab it develop it nurture it I think you should go for it absolutely thank you so much Hannah for calling in um, we just have a couple minutes before the end of our show but I wanted to ask you have you ever come close to wanting to throw in the towel I did <laughs> <laughs> and how do you feel well, at the time, it was kind of, th I was thrown <laughs> under the bus instead of thrown in the towel. But at the time, I was devastated. Mm. I left politics. It's like, it's like getting a divorce mm. or, or a death for about a year. I was in absolute mourning. But in, in retrospect, it's been allowed me to have a different aspect of my life in a very positive way. So I'm, again, I'm a big believer that things happen for a reason. Mm. And when a door closes, another door opens. So all that to be said, if, if, I can be helpful now to encourage other young women, then it's handing on the, uh, the bateau or the torch. The, 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 the torch, not the bateau, but the baton. <laughs> the bateau. <laughs> the relay, yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Alexander, any final thoughts for everyone? Well, I, I lost an election in 2011, mm -hmm. and like Sheila said, it was it's so devastating. devastating. I, was, I had a six month depression that mm -hmm. I mean, I barely could get out of bed. It was very bad was very bad all the more because I didn't I didn't lose any vote my voters stuck with me they were there they just all the other ones just concentrated in one and voted for one party but anyway that was the NDP wave in Quebec and but that r reason doesn't come into it it's all about your emotions mm -hmm. and because you if you believe in what you're doing you dedicate your life to what you're doing and you think you're doing the best you can, and then you feel so rejected, and mm -hmm, it is. Mm -hmm. It's a divorce, it's mourning, it's very difficult. And the party piece, too, because for uh, me yes. it was more internally in the party. For you it was, but yeah. then you We're pick yourself up. We're now at the end up. of our show, so I have you to You pick yourself up, and you do it again, and I won the <laughs> second time. Thank you so much, ladies, for coming in and sharing your expertise Thank you, with our viewers. Thank you so much for watching. We lovely. will see you in the studio <laughs> next week. Have a great evening. <laughs>